Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Um, even if you're just getting extra credit, I hope this is worth your time. Um, so like you said, I'm gonna be talking about sanctuary cities. Um, and this is an ongoing project. So what I have today is just what I've learned so far, kind of where I'm at with my research. Um, but I'm not here to kind of take a stand, defend a side. I just wanna offer an overview of what the issue is, where it came from, and what the current debate is really all about. Um, I'm gonna learn how to use this as we go. So I wanna start with defining the actual term sanctuary. Um, I just think it's important to know what words mean when we're talking about them. So if we look at the Oxford English Dictionary, it's a building or place set apart for the worship of God, um, a church or another sacred place. Um, from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a consecrated place such as the ancient Hebrew temple, um, or a place of refuge and protection. So, as is implied by these definitions, the concept of sanctuary has religious origins. So, though almost every major religion has some concept of sanctuary, it is usually attributed to the Old Testament and the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, so, in the Old Testament, the word sanctuary is usually used to describe the dwelling place of God among the people. So, in Exodus 15, 17, we have... The place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands have established. Um, but the idea of sanctuary is also seen in the establishment of what they called cities of refuge. So the Hebrew people set aside specific locations where individuals had committed unintentional crimes, usually murder, could go and have safety from the punishment that they might have otherwise received. So if we look at Numbers 3511, select some towns to be your cities of refuge, to which a person who has killed someone accidentally may flee. So this idea of sanctuary as a protection of guilty individuals from the law survived all the way to the medieval Catholic Church. Over time, though, the church-mandated sanctuaries declined in popularity because they were coming into conflict with the governing authorities at the time. Um, however, the concept was reborn within the secular realm. So in the 17th century, the political idea of asylum was established so that sovereign nations could provide um, protection to individuals within their borders if they would choose to do so. So although these two words, sanctuary and asylum, are almost synonymous, sanctuary is usually understood as a more religious term, whereas asylum is a political term. So the first signs of the practice of sanctuary in the United States um, can be seen during the establishment of the Underground Railroad. So individuals and organizations organized came together to provide safety for runaway slaves. Um, but what is commonly recognized as the sanctuary movement of modern times really started during the presidency of Ronald Reagan. So in the 1980s, there were civil wars happening in Central America, specifically in the countries of El Salvador and Guatemala and a lot of these people started seeking asylum in the United States. So at the time, um, there was a policy in place in the United States that foreign nationals who had a, a fear of persecution that could be validated by the United States government could be granted asylum in the United States. Um, so when these people started coming from Central America on the, on the basis of asylum, only a few cases were actually evaluated to meet those specific criteria. So the US government deemed that most of the people coming were simply um, migrants looking for economic improvement, so economic migrants, as opposed to what we would call refugees who were really in danger of their lives. Um, and there were a lot of Americans at the time who thought that this was unjust, and so they decided that they were gonna take matters into their own hands. So what we have, is the first sanctuary movement, um, which started in the 1980s as a result of the Reagan administration's immigration policies. Um, the birthplace of this movement is typically attributed to Tucson, Arizona. So there were several churches in the area that took it upon themselves to help these immigrants come illegally into the United States. And so they were helping them by transportation, they were giving them physical sanctuary within their church buildings. Um, and so one of the most well-known churches that was involved in this was called Southside Presbyterian Church in Arizona. It was led by Pastor John Fife, who claimed that his actions were justified based on his obligation to a higher moral law. So he believed that he could, even though what he was doing might have been illegal, it was okay because he was obeying God because this is what he felt that he was supposed to do. 
And so this caught on. He was not the only one that had these feelings. Um, during the years between 1982 and 1987, over 400 churches offered sanctuary to illegal immigrants coming from South Central America. Um, and it didn't take long for this to overflow into the public sector. So there were cities, states, and other organizations, namely college universities, um, that began offering sanctuary until it was said to have been the largest grassroots civil disobedience movement in the United States since the 1960s. So just to give you an idea, um, this pledge is still on the website of Southside Presbyterian Church. So this is something that they still advocate for. Um, they still believe in providing sanctuary to um, undocumented immigrants. They've kind of adapted this as part of their church's um, goals and almost a ministry. So you can see how powerful these ideas are. They're, they really believe in these things, um, and that's why it's become such a large movement. So in 1996, the United States government responded to the sanctuary movement um, with immigration reform. It was called the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, I-I-R-I-R-A, it's a lot. Um, <laughs> so the goal overall was to increase border security and to increase punishment for those who were assisting illegal immigrants in crossing the border. So two of the more important aspects of this were U.S. Code 1373, which this, um, this immigration reform introduced, and it regulated communication between local and federal officials, saying that um, local governments could not prohibit the sharing of information between the local governments and the federal government. Also, the IIRIRA um, amended U.S. Code 1324, which criminalized the transportation and harboring of illegal immigrants. And so this was a direct hit at these people in Arizona who were trying to help these people, um, these illegal immigrants, cross the border. And so that was a huge um, immigration reform that had you know, lasting impacts onto how we approach immigration now. But another major event that happened in 2001 that impacted immigration was the terrorist attacks of September 11th. So previously, immigration wasn't necessarily seen as something that had to do with national security. But after the events of um, September 11th, um, concern for national security in the United States was obviously heightened, like we'd never really seen before. And so in response, the Department of Homeland Security created the Immigrations and Customs Enforcement Agency, or ICE, in 2003. So this was a combination of two former agencies, the U.S. Customs Service and the Immigration and Naturalization Service, but they combined to create ICE, which is now one comprehensive organization. And so the role of ICE is mainly to enforce federal laws governing border control, customs, trade, and immigration to promote homeland security and public safety. So in 2008, ICE implemented a program known as Secure Communities, and this was to allow ICE to access fingerprints of individuals in American prisons, check their immigration status, and take actions to deport them. Under Secure Communities, law, local law enforcement were expected to share the fingerprint data with the FBI and ICE, and ICE also requested that persons subject to removal be detained in local facilities for up to 48 hours while ICE reviewed their cases to see if they were eligible for deportation. Um, there was a lot of disapproval for various aspects of the Secure Communities Program. Part of that was a lot of people didn't like the fact that individuals who had committed minor crimes were held for extra time in detention facilities and were subject to deportation. Um, also, the, the detaining process in general, people claimed was inhumane, was unjust. Um, they were against the process of detaining the individuals in the local facilities. And so um, the cooperation between ICE and local jurisdictions started to decline. Um, and they started imposing limitations on their specific cooperations with federal immigration officers, and so that is where we get what we're seeing today, which is known as sanctuary cities. So in 2014, based on a lot of the disagreements with the Secure Communities Program, it was replaced with the Priority Enforcement Program, which tried to focus on apprehending more dangerous criminals um, and concentrated resources on border security and national security as opposed to individuals and local communities. And so though there were sanctuary policies in many jurisdictions at this point, what has brought the issue back into the center of public policy attention in more recent times are President Trump's policies in regards to immigration. 
So on January 25th, 2017, shortly after his inauguration, the president passed an executive order threatening to withhold federal funding from jurisdictions who continued to act, enact sanctuary policies, specifically those that were in conflict with US Code 1373. This order also reinstated the, the Secure Communities Program, which is a more strict enforcement of federal immigration policies in local communities. So with the federal government taking such a firm stance on sanctuary cities, this issue has become a crucial public policy debate that is having, gonna have to be addressed. Um, so before I go any further with an, analyzing the debate, I just wanna make sure we have an understanding of what a sanctuary city really is. So it's not easy to define and it makes the debate even more difficult than it already is because sanctuary city is not actually an official term. There's no legal definition. Not even all jurisdictions that enact sanctuary policies um, do it in the same way, and not all of them are even cities at all. There are counties and entire states enacting sanctuary policies, so sanctuary city in itself isn't really a comprehensive term for what's going on. In one instance, the Department of Justice defined sanctuaries as jurisdictions that may have state laws, local ordinances, or departmental policies limiting the role of local law enforcement agencies and officers in the enforcement of immigration laws. But that is still a very, very broad definition that does not encompass what's happening in each individual city, state, county. Um, so in general, a sanctuary city can be described as one that does not cooperate fully with the efforts of the federal immigration enforcements as maybe they otherwise would or as much as the federal government would like them to. So oftentimes sanctuary policies are called limited cooperation policies because that gives a better definition of what they actually are. So it's also important to know what a sanctuary city is not. So sanctuary policies do not necessarily guarantee exemption to any illegal immigrant from deportation. Even if local law enforcement do not want to comply with enforcing federal policies, the federal government is still entitled to bring about their actions towards their ends, which would be enforcing their own immigration policies. Um, and so, like I've said, no two sanctuary cities function the same. There are different policies being enacted in each different jurisdiction. But, in general, there are three main types of sanctuary policies. So the don't ask policies discourage local law enforcement from asking residents questions regarding their immigration status. The don't enforce policies place specific limits on arrests and detentions based on immigration status. The don't tell policies prevent local officials from sharing immigration related information with federal officials. And so some jurisdictions may be using one, two, all three of these types of policies and they may not even be playing out in the same way. So again, it's really difficult to nail down exactly what's going on in each sanctuary jurisdiction because none of them look exactly the same. So just to give an idea of the geography of sanctuary cities, this is a map um, that was recently updated in November 2017, so this isn't exactly accurate to today, but just to give an idea of where the counties, states, and cities are located, you can tell there's obvious concentrations um, of where this is going on. And so one of the most important cities in the sanctuary discussion is San Francisco. So San Francisco has had its city and county of refuge ordinance in place since 1989, which in general prohibits city employees from using city funds or resources to assist ICE in the enforcement of federal immigration law unless such assistance is required by federal or state law. And then in 2013, it passed another sanctuary policy known as the due process for all ordinance that limits when city law enforcement officers may give ICE advance notice of a person's release from local jail. It also prohibits cooperation with ICE detainer requests. So not only are San Francisco's policies some of the more intense, if we're looking at a comparison of sanctuary policies across the board, but they have been a catalyst for a lot of the current debate that's coming out against sanctuary cities. So in March 2015, the California City District Attorney's Office declined to prosecute a marijuana charge and subsequently released a Mexican national, Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez, who is an illegal immigrant and convicted felon. The DA's office, however, did not notify ICE officials who had requested a detainer in order to take Lopez Sanchez into custody. This action or inaction on the part of the local law enforcement of San Francisco was the result of the sanctuary policies that they had in place. And three months later, 
Lopez Sanchez were, was responsible for the death of an American woman, Kate Steinle. You might have heard this has been all over the news. Um, and so based on this and other cases similar, there has been a lot of outcry from the side of the opposition to sanctuary cities as it specifically relates to crime. And so those who are in opposition say that with the decreased risk of deportation, undocumented persons who are residing in sanctuary jurisdictions are more inclined to participate in criminal activity. Also, the existence of these limited cooperation policies in general could attract non-citizens that are more likely to engage in crime, which would lead to a greater concentration of these potential criminals in specifically sanctuary cities. However, on the other hand, those who support sanctuary cities, and one of the large reasons that they have been created in the first place, is that people claim that these cities um, promote public safety because there's a greater cooperation between the individuals that might be in fear of deportation and the local law enforcement. So whereas an illegal immigrant might be reluctant to report a crime that might be happening, they would be more likely to do that and participate and engage with local law enforcement if there was a less of a fear that they were going to be deported. Um, there are other arguments for and against sanctuary policies that relate to economics. So those in favor of sanctuary cities say that compliance with the ICE detainers actually cost local jurisdictions money and that these local resources should not be allocated towards in the enforcement of federal immigration policy. Um, on the other hand, Many people claim that illegal immigrants impose costs on American citizens by receiving benefits that are funded by taxpayers and by filling job positions that might otherwise be available to American citizens. One of the more complex aspects of the discussion is the legality. So are sanctuary cities legal or are they not? Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution assigns the role of immigration to the federal government, saying that the Congress shall have the power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. The Tenth Amendment of the Constitution states that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So as it relates specifically to sanctuary cities, there are a lot of issues surrounding the idea of federalism at play. What is the proper relationship between the states and Congress as it relates to immigration? Are local jurisdictions legally obligated to participate in immigration enforcement? How far can these localities legally go in standing in the way of the federal government from fulfilling its role? Also, are the sanctuary jurisdictions in violation of U.S. Code 1373, which states that local governments cannot prohibit information sharing with ICE, or U.S. Code 1324 that outlaws the transportation or harboring of illegal immigrants? So at this point, there are some court cases that offer precedents for arguments on either side of the justification for sanctuary cities, but nothing explicitly regarding the issue has been adjudicated. So it's really difficult at this point to say specifically whether or not what's going on in these cities is legal or not. And there may be cities enacting some policies that are legal, some policies that are illegal. It might not, we might not be able to say as a whole, you know, is San Francisco a breachment of the law? Maybe in some cases, maybe not. Maybe some sanctuary cities are in violation of the law, maybe some are not. So it's really hard to make a blanket statement whether or not this is legal or not, um, which makes this really difficult, especially for lawmakers trying to address the issue. So obviously, all of these aspects of the sanctuary city debate are very important and very complex, um, but need to be resolved. But the aspect that I found the most interesting as I've continued my research goes back to the spiritual origins of the sanctuary movement. So, the leaders of the sanctuary movement of the 1980s claimed that their, their actions were justified based on their obligation to a higher moral law. And it seems that some of these ideas are now overflowing into the political discourse that we're hearing today. So much of what is permeating the conversation about sanctuary cities has to do with social justice, the protection of human rights. For example, in a recent debate, I don't know if you saw this, two men that are running for governor of Florida, um, debated specifically sanctuary cities, and the mayor of Tallahassee, Andrew Gillum, said that one of his reasons for supporting sanctuary cities was that he wanted to stand up for people who felt like they didn't belong. So that is obviously a very, you know, moral argument coming out of um, politics for sanctuary cities. Other sanctuary advocates say that federal immigration policies encourage racism and anti-immigrant sentiments. 
Um, and so it has become very obvious to me as I've continued my research that there are much deeper issues at play with this issue than simply public policy preferences. Um, and unfortunately, as much as I would love to solve this problem right now, I do not have all the answers to all the questions that I have developed as I have gone through my research, um, and I do not yet or may never have a solution to the immigration problem that we're having. And it's also become clear to me that the issue of sanctuary cities cannot be separated from immigration as a whole. And so as I continue with my research, my goal is just to provide clarity into this issue and to hopefully bring some insights into all the factors that are at play. Um, and so some of the questions that I'm going to be looking at as I go forward include, so many say that America is a nation of immigrants, so what does that entail? What does this mean? Should our approach to immigration change as our nation grows and changes? What is the rule of law and how should it inform our approach to immigration? What is the proper role of American government and how does that affect our approach to immigration? What, if any, is the moral obligation of the United States towards illegal aliens currently in our country and those who wish to immigrate here in the future? How does our approach to immigration impact American culture and values? And these are only a few of the questions that are very relevant to this topic. Um, so I know that I'm probably leaving you with more questions and answers at this point, but I hope that I've at least provided a comprehensive introduction to the issue, um, maybe sparked your interest in sanctuary cities and American public policy as a whole. I would encourage you, if this interests you, um, to just remain informed on the issues happening in our nation and in the world. Um, and as you formulate opinions and advocate for policy changes, that you would always seek um, truth and facts in the things that you're learning. So thank you. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Um, I don't know if I have answers to your questions. But. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of challenges did you face as you were approaching researching this? Yeah, um, so many. Um, so this is obviously a newer, this has been going on for a long time, but the sanctuary city debate is a newer and more relevant issue. And a lot of the you know writing that's been that's being done on it is local newspapers, opinions. Um, it's very polarized, so it's really really hard to find resources that are objective that even really give you facts as opposed to just opinions. Um, it's really hard to find comprehensive research that's been done even on the claims that are being made, whether they're true, whether they hold up. Um, so a lot of what I've been having to do is like a giant, a giant puzzle and just putting it all together. Um, there's not like one stop shop for research um, on this topic. So it's definitely been very challenging. Yeah. Um, okay, well, yeah. How has this affected your view on federalism? <sighs> um, well, it's really hard. So I think Federalism as a whole um, seems really simple, you know? It's a good idea, right? The states have their, the US government has its own obligations, whereas the states have their own responsibilities. Um, they work together, but they're separate. But when it comes to something specific like this, where it's hard to outline, you know, objectively, explicitly, okay, here's where the states can come into conflict with federal government, here's where they cannot, um, you kind of hit this gray area where if they want to say, okay, we're not going to participate in immigration, you know, maybe that's okay. But if they're going to say, we're going to, you know, physically get in your way, that's not. So there's kind of this middle ground um, that maybe isn't allowed for um, in the Constitution. You know, what do we do about that? Um, specifically, I've seen that although the enforcement of immigration is given to the federal government, I'm not sure that that's effective. Um, I think that the participation of local jurisdictions is needed um, for it to play out because it's just very, very difficult for federal officers to, to do the job that they're meant to do. Um, so it's, it's tricky, yeah. Um, well, specifically, so a lot of the, so specifically the demographic, I guess, of people that are involved in sanctuary cities are mostly Central and South American people. Um, 
And the reason I think that you know more people from those countries immigrate here as opposed to you know Europeans or um, other places is that there are things happening within their governments that lead them, you know, to want to seek a better life, which obviously we sympathize with. Um, and so I think, yeah, there's definitely an over overflow. We're very close neighbors with all of these countries, um, and we're, it's not surprising that we're going to experience effects from the things that are going on there. So. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cities are in more like liberal or like democratic areas mm -hmm. versus like more like the southern areas where like there weren't as many How, what influences do you really think impact like where they're located yeah i think definitely um the people that in those in those areas i don't know if what do you want to call them like blue states red states liberal conservative um but the people who tend to be in the political areas more concerned with ideas of social justice, um, human rights, those types of things, have very obvious concentrations. Um, and those are the places where they're advocating for sanctuary cities. Whereas the people who tend to be more um, on the side of you know, the rule of law, enforcing our own policies, um, you know, putting America first kind of thing, tend to be less inclined to advocate for sanctuary cities. So I think you see you know, the ways people argue for all types of political issues is going to play out in something like this. Mm -hmm. Are you hoping to hopefully find some sort of solution or a part of a solution? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you're trying to raise awareness about the subject, which is important, but along the way, have you been really interested in trying to find what, what solutions can be put out there? Yeah, obviously it's frustrating um, looking at something that's so complicated, obviously has so many problems. And I, I want to say, you know, here's what we need to be done. Here's the solution. Here's how we fix it. That's obviously really hard. Um, that's not necessarily my goal. If, you know, I have some amazing insights as I do my research and it just comes to me, that would be amazing. Um, I'm not expecting that to happen. I would love to, you know, be able to say some suggestions, some ideas. But I don't think um, in the scope of this project I'll be able to give a comprehensive solution to the problem. Well, thank you so much for coming. I hope this was informative. Um, so yeah, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. I might not have an answer, but I'll try. Tell you what I know. So thank you. <laughs>